How do you crowdsource or harness the power of your customers to share knowledge, share best practices, you know, optimize the value of their investment in your platform, capture ideas? I mean, Apple is an incredible example. We've been there. They have one of the strongest communities in the world. And I actually have several friends from the HP community days that actually are at Apple now running the support community. I have other friends in the industry that used to run the Apple community years ago. And, you know, with that, it's like anything else. When you go by Hello, podcast. ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Grand Slam Journey Podcast, where I, together with my guests, discuss various topics related to finding our passion and purpose, maximizing our potential, sports, life after sports, and transitioning from one chapter of our lives to the next, growing our skills and leadership, and whatever we decide to put our minds into. For my guest today... Donnie Weinstein, Areas of Community Building. Donnie and I discuss his passion in tennis, corporate community building, and Israel. Donnie is from Israel, and I figured it makes sense to talk to someone who is from that area of the world to discuss what has been going on lately. For context... This conversation has been recorded about a couple weeks ago, and so a lot has transpired since then. We start the podcast talking about Donnie's upbringing and what led him to tennis. Donnie shares how playing tennis helped him develop his mind and strategic thinking, and how it's a good analogy for life. We talk about the importance of staying focused and having a routine before matches, as well as the value of learning from losses and taking a step back to understand what happened. Donnie shares his journey of becoming an expert in community building. He has an extensive experience in building a community and highlights the importance of communities in improving customer engagement and satisfaction. Donnie advises starting with the most important and passionate customers to incubate and crowdsource ideas for driving the vision of your community. He also emphasizes the need to connect with conversations happening in channels that are not owned by the company. So what's the value of community building? This whole episode has been a big learning for me, and I realized how little I knew about the importance of building a community around your brand and the whole process of it. Donnie explained it beautifully. He calls it the MSEE model. The MSEC stands for marketing, which leads to advocacy. Your top customers are the most passionate about your brand. And when you find them and identify them, You can harness the community to drive advocacy. The S stands for support. Well-run communities create answers and solutions that lower customer support costs as the community provides answers and feedback for other customers via contribution, such as sharing their tips, guidance, and expertise. E stands for education, which translates to content. Communities create great content that allow your customers to learn and use your products more rapidly, leading to greater adoption. And the last E stands for engineering, which translates to innovation. Your top customers are the biggest users for your product and in many cases have the best ideas to make your products and services even better. Donnie shares some real business examples of creative rewards and marketing strategies and wealth of resources for building community as well as supporting Israel, which is a topic that we dive into at the very end of this podcast. I've had a blast talking to Donnie about all things tennis, business, community, as well as the difficult situation in Israel. I hope you do your research. I know there's quite a bit of misinformation happening, and so please study the history, look at things from all angles, 
before you evaluate what is right and what is wrong. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, I want to ask you to please share it with someone who you believe may enjoy it as well. Consider leaving a review on Apple Podcast or Spotify. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. This is your host, Clara Jakoshova. Thank you for tuning in. And now I bring you Donnie Weinstein. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation to be on Grand Slam Journey podcast. How are you? I'm doing okay, Clara. I'm really happy to have this opportunity and I appreciate you having me on the podcast. Yeah, I know it's actually a hard time for you and your family. I'm sure being from Israel, all that's happening. So um hope to get into a little bit of that, but obviously talk mainly about your background and tennis. So hopefully this podcast will be also a little bit of fun than just serious. But I think given what we have been all reading and watching, it justifies to have some conversation around it. But before we dive into many of these topics, I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself, please. Donnie Weinstein. So, you know, my name is spelled Danny, I pronounced Donnie. And uh, I've been in the community world now going back to probably late, later part of 2007. So going on 16 plus years here. I'm kind of kind of a global citizen, so I was born and raised in the in the New York City area on Long Island. I've studied abroad at both Tel Aviv University and the Rodman School of Management in both undergraduate and graduate school. Uh, I lived in Israel for quite a few years, so I speak the language. My my dad is is uh, from Israel, and we have quite a bit of family there. And I had the opportunity to meet Clara through our you know common connection with Ilana Golan and Leap, and. Um, yeah, I'm super excited here to talk about my passion in both uh, community as well as uh, tennis. Yes, so we're going to touch base on many of those things. And you touch base actually a little bit on your background and upbringing, but I'm always curious how our upbringing shapes our passion that we choose for ourselves, perhaps even later on. And sometimes it is very planned and purposeful. Sometimes it seems like we just stumble across of things, but they seem to resonate with us early on in our childhood. So I know you're big into tennis. We've shared a couple of connections and calls talking about tennis and your passion and creating even community through tennis and leading the teams to some great national representation and tournaments. And you actually built community in your profession around the technology and what you do in SAP. So I'm uh -huh. curious if you reflect back on your childhood and upbringing, what are some of the key things that influenced your passion towards sports and sort of this community aspect? So I grew up in uh, you know middle, middle class suburbia on Long Island, and you know great place to grow up uh, at that time. And you know both working parents, we had a nice house and we had food on the table, but it was also like, well, you know, if you want to go and have something nice, you need to go work for it, and so. I've been working since the age of 13. I took my dad's lawnmower with my best friend across the street. We started to go around the neighborhood and essentially build our own community of, of a landscaping business. And so by you know the first year, we made enough money to buy our own equipment. And by the second year, we had a little empire of about 40 houses. And you know, with that, they kind of kept us out of trouble and we learned how you know the basics of business and how you you know hustle and and uh get word you know referrals and word of mouth and understand how to deal with all kinds of people you know friendly and angry and you know knowing the personalities whether you're going to get paid on time or not get can get paid on time and what good customer service is like and it was sort of like a year round thing because you had not only the, the the grass cutting year round but then you would clean up the leaves in the fall and then when the snow fell they would call you to come clean their driveways and so that was a great thing but it also told me the ethic of you know working hard and earning enough money to buy a car buy a nice stereo and save money for college. And with that, my parents taught my brothers and I those values that you've got to work hard and, and education was incredibly important. And so we were fortunate enough to get into some decent schools and have my parents pay for that. So that was sort of, I think, an early aspect of you know your community. I think the other piece too is just, I was raised Jewish, you're part of the Jewish community. So that too was also an important part of my, my upbringing. On, on the sports side, I really wasn't a very big kid or particularly athletic. However, tennis is definitely in my family DNA. My grandmother played till she was 86 years old. Wow. I didn't take it back from my grandmother until she was 78 and I was 13. 
My mother still plays. She's 87 years old and is playing twice a week, you know, with all the other 89 year olds. That's amazing. And I've been playing since the age of eight, not competitively, but just for fun. And I did play in high school. But I do remember going to the US Open every year back in New York, uh, sitting in all the cheap seats, you know, really high up because the first week take the train there and seeing people like Roscoe Tanner and John McEnroe and, and so on. And, and in addition to that, we would also always watch the majors. I mean, the Grand Slams on TV every year. So that kind of planted the seed as far as, you know, sport for me. I, I really became passionate about playing tennis and I, I've been playing with friends for many years and then I started playing league in 2009. And so I was fortunate to was a sort of sort of a sandbagger 3.0. We'll get into the kind of the ratings later on. But I did start captaining when I was a 3.5. I was fortunate to take my team to uh, Nationals back oh, about 10 years ago. And we came in fourth in the country. And so still playing quite a few teams. And that keeps me fit and uh, somewhat sane. Love it. And I'm also curious what attracted you to tennis. Because I have to admit, every guest I ask about their passion for sport and even tennis particularly, I learned some new things uh, because it seems like there's always different things that we appreciate about it. So it seemed like it was clear you had some precedence as far as your grandma and your mom played. So you had family members you can observe and it seemed like they opened up your eyes towards the sport naturally. But as you look back, is there something that really resonated with you? Why tennis? Yeah, so certainly it was, there's definitely familial uh, influence there, number one. Number two, uh, I mean, I played a lot of, you know, Little League baseball and, uh, we, you know, we play stickball or touch football in the street, but I really wasn't a, a good enough athlete to be competitive in either one of those sports uh, in high school. And I was pretty good at tennis. So that was sort of one. And two, I think the fact of, you know, on one hand, it's really, if you're playing doubles, it can be a team sport, but I really thrived on the singles aspect of it. And so as I grew older, it really helps you, I think, develop your mind mm. and your strategic thinking, because especially when you're a singles player, you know, you can start really strong and you have to maintain that level of composure in order to get across the finish line. As you probably know, the hardest games to win are the, the final points of a match. At the same time, if you have a weak beginning you have to recompose yourself. And it's sort of like the analogy, the analogy I put is that you're, you're like an, you're on an island mm. and you've got to figure out how do you recompose yourself? How do you think about, all right, this is a new situation or maybe there's a situation you, you've been in before. You reflect upon that, you adjust, you pivot. And that's just like, uh, it's a good analogy for life. You know, life is not a straight line up or down. It kind of, you have, you know, peaks and valleys and as you experience life, you learn, grow, and hopefully develop uh, even more. And I think the same is true with uh, with tennis. Yeah. I love that about the sport, actually, too. And there's some aspect of you're there completely alone. Obviously, you have maybe fans or coaches cheering for you. But then at the end of the day, it's very black and white. There is nobody else you can hide behind. If you win, you win because you were better than the opponent that day. Mm-hmm. With exceptions, there are sometimes those very, very close matches. So one or two balls make a difference, but that happens very, very rarely. And if you lose, you lose only because you are worse than the opponent. Yeah. And so um, the wins and losses, you can celebrate quite a bit, but they also hurt quite a bit. And so there's a lot of analysis and strategy that you can then adjust based on how you play that day. And um, but it's very black and white sport. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there was a period of time when I lived, when I actually lived in Tel Aviv, I was trying to play squash and tennis at the same time, mm -hmm. which is very hard to do because they're yeah. different functions of the wrist. You know, in tennis, you're not moving your wrist, squash, you have to. And I decided I'm going to stick with tennis. But with that, I integrated some pretty nasty spin and slice into my game. And so many people don't like playing against me. And I didn't discover Brad Gilbert's Winning Ugly book until I was captaining uh, about 11 years ago. And I started reading, I'm like, oh, this is my Bible. And so for people who don't know, Brad Gilbert, he didn't have the same level of skill as, let's say, a Connors or a McEnroe, but he beat people like that with his, with his mental game. So I like to tell people that tennis is, you, you've got to have the physical skills, but tennis is very much 70% mm -hmm. mental and 30% physical. You know, if you can... You've got the game, but you have to figure out how to navigate, you know, the water, understand your opponent. And for me, the longer the match goes on, the better chance I have to win because I break people down mentally. Love it. And I love your comparison. Thank you for stating that the differences between squash and tennis, because for whatever reason, people typically 
think that they're very similar, even racquetball, or sometimes they throw table tennis. Like they ask me, are you good in table tennis? <laughs> I've played table tennis for fun. You know, back in the day when I was a kid, maybe for a week when we had in the winter conditioning and we would play it in a way that, you know, you have a team and you run in a circle and you rotate, you hit a ball and you go on the opposite side. But I'm awful at whatever other racket sport other than tennis. Well, although like I know how to hit a ball with the rackets because there's the hand-eye coordination, but they're very different. I remember once going to play a racquetball actually with my friend in college and he was more of a racquetball player. And so obviously he beat me very easily because I didn't know how to move between the four walls. That's another thing that like constrained me. I would run into walls and then we went back on the court and I couldn't hit a ball. It was so weird because the technique was so different. I was like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I took, a, I did take a racquetball class in college. Uh, the gal taught us, I think, was like top five in the United States at the time. So you know, that was, mm -hmm. fun. and you know, squash was kind of interesting. But again, my passion came back to tennis, and even now with all the pickleball craze. I mean, I played pickleball several years ago when we'd have rainouts here in California. We we'd play indoor, but it's a totally different game. So you know, for me, I still have a pretty solid game. And especially now that I, I after going to Nationals, I got bumped to 4-0. If you're 4-0, you're basically playing people that were at college level or even higher. And doing that at a singles level is very challenging. And so going from winning 80-85% 80, 80, of matches as a 3-5 singles to maybe 15-20%, which is fine. Again, you kind of grow your game. But now I, I actually got bumped down. I'm playing a lot more. I learned to play more doubles as a 4-0. And now I'm playing, again, as a 3-5. I'm also playing more mixed. So 7-0, 8-0. And um, still having a chance to compete pretty well. So recently we went to sections um, in 3 5, 18 over. Last fall we were in uh, 7 0 men's league that went uh, to Orlando, we came in six in the country. And um, it's fun. I mean, I enjoy the sport. And, I know, and even to that point, there's definitely an element of community. So even as a captain, I would get to know players from the different clubs and they're just starting to strategize mm -hmm. lineups and seeing who, who your matchups are going to be. And and even going back years ago, sure, everybody wants to win. But I think when you lose, you actually, you grow. And this is like startups for business as well. When you fail, you're, you know, you learn, you actually grow from that. And so, you know, 11 years ago, we were, there were 23, five teams in Sacramento. They had two flights of 10 teams each. The top two would go to playoffs. We were 11 and two. We had to beat the last place team in our last match. Nobody else had only two losses. And I, I was on vacation. We lost three guys to availability. Uh, the other team played out of their minds. We ended up losing on the default. We dropped and we got knocked out of the playoffs. And so that was sort of devastating. But the next year we rebounded and, you know, we, we went all the way to uh, to nationals. So it's simply um, like anything else. You have to kind of take a step back, understand what happened, learn from it. As long as you're learning and growing, it's, uh, it, it, you, you know, there's opportunity to improve and get to the next level. Yeah. And I... 100% wish I knew that skill earlier on when I really competed when it mattered, but learning how to lose and taking it objectively, not emotionally, and looking at what can I improve and get better at is definitely a skill that one can continue to master, I think, for the rest of <laughs> our lives. I'm way better at it, obviously, now, but also because tennis doesn't mean so much that it used to back in the day. Um, there's way bigger pressure and the losses are obviously way more impactful and important than, let's say, losing now in a tournament. But it's always fun competing. Do you have any tips or tricks on how you look at losses now and how you digest the information you've gathered to help you improve and get to the next step, like overcome that pain from the loss? Yeah, I mean, you have to put things in into perspective. And even in, within a match, it's really, it's that mental game. And so it's really trying to, you know, one of, one of our, our uh, pros who actually gave us a lot of coaching on our way to nationals, uh, Doug Atkinson, his analogy is if you, if you have a bad point or bad game, it's basically, the, the analogy is it's like the water going down a shower drain. It's gone. It's not coming back. And each point is, is a fresh, it's essentially a fresh start. So mm -hmm. it's a question of who can play calmer, more composed. And even as I tell people, it's their first time to districts or first time in playoffs, first time to section, I said, you don't have to play like a 4-5. You have to play a strong 3-5 or 4 a game, what you're rated at. 
and you have to do it calmly. And so it's easier said than done. But if the more that you can be relaxed and focus on, mm-hmm. and I always tell my my teammates, look, that's the first couple of games. It's not about crushing the ball, or it's about let's find you know get ball control, get comfortable, get placement, put the ball where you put where you want to put it. If they may, if they beat you on a great shot, okay, that's great. But if you Beat yourself, that's a different story. And even when I was competing at four, you're playing these young guys that are singles players. The advantage that I had is a lot of the 18, 19, 20 year olds, they just want to hit the ball really hard. They don't care about a mental game. And so with that, if you're, and one of my strengths is actually getting every ball back and making them hit another ball and another ball and another ball. And so with that, if you make get them frustrated and get under their skin, then they're going to bound, bound to make mistakes. And so it's a, as I said earlier, it's a, there's a strategy to it. There's a mental game to it. And again, I think I go back to, you know, Brad Gilbert and look at the success he's had now with uh, Coco Goff and even prior to that with, you know, Agassi and, and Andy Roddick. I was actually going to comment the strategy that you mentioned was literally the strategy that Coco applied that helped her win the U.S. Open, like in the finals, especially the third set. I mean, what was visible is she was just fighting every ball, resetting yeah. and just going the extra mile. and making her hit the extra shot and Sablinka eventually broke down. I think mentally she started overhitting too much, going for way too much, which helped Coco get her footing and, and win. So yeah, I love what you mentioned. It literally the finalists came into my mind when you said it. No, that's a great example. I mean, which that that match was incredible between Coco and Sablinka. And yeah, Sablinka is like the hardest hitting female out there. I mean, it's incredible. And to your point, it's about at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what's five miles an hour or 105 miles an hour. If you're not hitting the ball in, in the court, it doesn't mean anything. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, again, it's <clears throat> so, those, you know, those analogies are good. And they've certainly helped me in, especially when you're playing casually or just hitting with friends or just it's not a necessarily a section match. But if you're having a, a pretty intense week at work and you got a lot, a lot on your mind, you're trying to figure out you're, you're like stuck in a project and then you, you start to play. A lot, a lot of for me, a lot of times I will actually my creativity will actually thrive in the tennis court. I'm like, oh my gosh, I just have now mm-hmm. an idea to figure out how to get, you know, move, kind of move the needle on something. So it's, it's for me, it's, it's not only physical therapy, it's also mental therapy. Yeah. And I do want to touch base on that also in the aspect of it. Obviously it's tennis player talking to a tennis player. So we don't have anybody who <laughs> can disagree with us or oppose. But I think one of the things in tennis that I really miss in any other sport, in other sport that I compare it such as lifting weights, CrossFit running that I sort of do on my own is the amount of focus that it requires. And so especially kind of the switching off from work to tennis, because you have to focus so much on so many things, the ball, your technique, moving, running, you can't play tennis effectively without being focused. And so going on the court now really allows me to disconnect from work on a way different level than if I were to just go lift weights, which I still do like in my gym, but it's just a different level of relaxation that I get and separation from kind of the day job. Does it happen to you as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. So if I'm racing to a match last minute and I'm getting off a conference call and like work is still in my mind and the chances of me being able to play my best game, it's, it's going to be challenging. And even uh, I'm playing seven five now. And one of the guys that's, that's on the team, I had an opportunity to play with him. I've always played against him, and he's one of the toughest four players in our local league. He's a lefty. He's really tall. He's like a you know a spider at the net. And he was on his phone literally a minute before we started the match. And he played like a three zero. We lost that match. I mean, he had he missed about ten overheads. He double faulted eight times, and I'm like, I was in shock. And he apologized to me, and it was like I could tell this it was all it was work, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. So if you can't disconnect, and again, it's that relaxation and, and it's that muscle. And again, it usually takes me a few games just to get warmed up. But point is, especially when it's more serious, if it's a playoff or you're getting to the districts or nationals, I've got kind of got my routine. You're disconnected from mm-hmm. from electronics, you're having a certain meal, but you want to have that warmer time and just like it's not just the stretching and you know, get your body physically warm. It's also just that, you know, you listen to certain music, but getting in a relaxed mode so that you can just play on, it's real, it's all about ball control. Mm-hmm. I love what you mentioned. And I always used to have a routine 
But I'm curious, what does your routine look like? You mentioned some aspects of it, but can you take us through? Do you have, let's say, a game is at 6 p.m.? What would ideal routine for you look like? Sure. So usually I want to get there, uh, you know, you get 30 minutes for war- for warm-ups. I try to be there on time for warm-ups. Usually an hour before I get there, I want to finish at least a meal, not a huge meal, but let's have, you know, have, have some carbs, get something in my in, in my system, make sure I've got plenty of water. Um, I've got like a power bar for, you know, in-between sets. Uh, one thing I've learned, especially as I've gotten older and especially playing in, in warm climates, like in, well, I'm in Northern mm-hmm. California, Sacramento, it's probably it's sim- probably similar to Austin as far as the heat goes. And I didn't know this years ago, but bringing extra, extra pairs of socks. So if you can't have a seven, six first set, as you get into your 30s, 40s, 50s, the changing socks on a change on a set changeover actually re- give, re-energizes your legs. So that's huge. But making sure, you know, you've got enough fluids and so on. And even earlier this year, we went down, we were at, uh, at sections. It was an early morning match. It wasn't very hot. It was in the Bay Area, but it was a really long match. And the second set, I think we were, we were up 4-2. I started cramping in both calves. So I took a medical for two minutes down again, you know, down to Gatorade. And they rattled off four games. They won second set, went to a tiebreak. We won the tiebreak like 10-8. But Point is that you know you don't you don't know when it's, when that's going to happen. So it's a matter of making sure you've got changing clothing, liquids, and just energy so that you're not depriving your body of, of the uh, electrolytes. And then you know once you arrive at the court, I have a routine of just you know s- certain stretches, specifically for my lower back. So you're doing a lot of hamstring stretches, you know, running for a few minutes, and then just you know hitting the ball, getting comfortable hitting the ball, whether it be at the net. Baseline strokes, whatever it may be, overheads, and then just, you know, getting the game on. Yeah. It seems like a good routine in many aspects, similar to what I go through. And yeah, you hit on all the big things. I wonder if it's a good time maybe just to shift a little bit more also to your professional life. And if you can describe a little bit the journey that it took you now being a community builder at SAP. I know you've had many various experiences, which I hope we can touch on as well. But what led you to the position you have now, Donnie? I've been a community leader for quite a while now, going back to, again, late 2007. And there really was no straight line or saying, oh, I mean, this is what I'm going to be when I grow up. I came out to California in, in the mid-90s for my MBA at University of California, Davis. I was fortunate to get hired at, at Hewlett Packard. I was a global product manager. You know, and people are like, well, what, is, what does a product manager do? Well, the way that I describe it is this was, this was in a very profitable division of a net, you know network printing product. So this was a time when people were in IT and in the office were moving from having everyone having a printer on their desk to having a centrally shared printer you know, in the office space. And so having those those network cards, either in the laser jet or, or external ones to share on the network was, was key. It was a very profitable business. The business was growing. And... We're mainly serving enterprise customers. So accounts like Citibank and State Farm, Fidelity, high-end enterprise accounts around the world. And so with that, responsibilities really were how do you negotiate or be that diplomat between, you know, the geeks in the lab that want to build cool stuff. They're like, well, we had this cool feature, but then dealing with the customer success teams, the salespeople, the account reps, well, what is the customer, what are they, what problems are they trying to solve? You know, what do they need in their next Mm -hmm. generation? So it's that balancing act of getting the right feature set, product mix, price points, time to market, all of the above, forecasting. And, you know, that was a really well-disciplined education for me. I mean, it was very regimented on on process, on reviews, on understanding, you know, what what we're going to do and when we should be launching new products. But also with that, doing, you know, international roadshows of new product introductions, doing market research with large accounts. But really incredible team building across functionally across the organization, make sure you're, you know, you're doing the right thing. Net net is I had from there, I went to a, a startup that HP had acquired, Verifone. I took over a part kind of a dead product line, traveled the world to kind of get the requirements because the salespeople were not cooperative. They wouldn't tell me anything and ended up killing that whole line. Came back to traditional HP and spent most of my career in, in support and services. So what does that mean? HP's consumer business was massive. So all the, you think about all the printers and PCs that were in the world at that time. This is back in, uh, in around 2000. And they had a massive support organization. So phone, email, chat, web. And 
held a series of global program management roles over several years. So overhauling the web experience to, you know, three clicks or less to get to the content you're finding, having the content written in consumer speak, not in a highly technical um, set of content. But then every kind of global program management role around chat support, email support, remote control support. In 2006, the Americas team won a JD Power Award for support. And in 2007, they were not renewing it because we were missing an HP owned or branded forum for support. So we had a charter to go and create one. We went to IT and they said, well, it's going to take us several years to build your community. They went all the way to the CEO because they said, we're not going to license anything from anybody. We're going to build everything ourselves. And we had an exception. So we vetted vendors. We ended up going with, at the time, it's called Lithium. And today they're called Chorus. And in 08, partnered with them. And I was on the ground floor of a uh, brand new social care team. So this is where my community journey began. And so I was on the original three-person team. And we launched uh, seven language communities in, in 15 months from the fall of 2008 through the spring of uh, 2010. English, French, German, Spanish, Portuguese, simplified Chinese, and Korean. So we had a global footprint. Each were separate communities, fully localized. We had teams in Amsterdam managing French and German, Sao Paulo for Spanish and Portuguese, Singapore for simplified Chinese and Korean. But this whole seven-year period became my PhD in community management, community leadership. How do you grow and scale? How do you optimize? How do you, you know, mentor your teams? And we went from you know nothing to drop. When I left at the end of 2014, there were uh, 2 million members. We were driving 9 million customers a month to the, to the community, 100 million customers a year. We won not one, but two grant soul awards, which is industry gold standard. And even within HP, the legacy enterprise communities that were homegrown were actually sunset and they, they adopted our model. So from there, I went to two unicorns, uh, the first one being Domo. I got hired to basically build out their brand new B2B community. They were a 400 person company, did not have any kind of presence and had a great run there, spending five and a half years building out their B2B community, running user groups, uh, really having fully integrated processes with support, with the customer success teams, education, and so on. And, you know, went through the IPO, did okay with the IPO. And then when COVID hit, that's, that was the time when I met, uh, met Ilana, they, uh, they were going through some downsizing and took advantage of that as sort of air cover and had a number of, of you know, downsizings during that period, which the second one I was affected by. So with that, and my first uh, tour with Leap, talked to a lot of great brands and ended up going to another unicorn, Kaltura. They were in the video SaaS world. Similar story, but in this case, they actually created the role to bring me on board and ended up spending about 15 months there. Now, the first six months could not have gotten any better. I had reviews all over the CEO. They approved 90% of my, of my budget. We hired vendors. We started building our community. Then, you know, we're getting ready for the IPO. They kind of slowed things down. Post IPO started to launch, wrap things up. And then um, early part of 22, they had a they had a rough quarter and they decided they can they let some people go. And I, I was impacted there. And so my second sabbatical was two summers ago. Again, talked to a lot of great brands and I was fortunate to join SAP. So I know it's kind of shared a lot about the journey, but when we talk about community, in, in these cases, it's been really about building out that web experience. And so it's that mm -hmm. community domain, but it's more than that. It's really when I talk about community, it's it's really about how do you crowdsource or harness the power of your customers to share knowledge, share best practices, you know, optimize the value of their investment in your platform, you know, capture ideas. I mean, Apple is an incredible example. You've been there. They have one of the strongest communities in the world. I actually know someone who ran the, I actually have several friends from the HP community days that actually are at mm -hmm. Apple now running the support community. I have other friends in the industry that used to run the Apple community years ago. And, you know, with that, it's like anything else. So when you go buy a new product today, we now, we're now conditioned to, well, I'm not going to go and pick up the phone and talk to the salesperson. No, you're going to go online and look at the reviews and Google it or go to Amazon reviews and see what people are saying about the product or the service. Mm -hmm. And it's all about that trusted advisor. And so if, you know, three generations ago, if our great grandparents had a car, you know, the first thing, to, if they had a problem with the car, they were going to, they weren't going to call up Ford as an example, they were going to go to their neighbor, Steve, down the street and say, oh, can you help me with my problem with my car? Or Susan, you know, if they have a problem, problem with their appliance, oh, Susan knows appliances, they're trusted advisor. So it's the same thing. So that can come through, again, the internet today, people Googling, finding information in a, in a forum. 
But then beyond that, it's also conversations, you know, people that go to Twitter or they go to YouTube or they go to channels that you don't necessarily own. So it's understanding where are the conversations that are happening about your brand in other channels that you don't necessarily control. And the last part is really the in-person connections. So it's all the meetups, all the user groups, all the conferences, all the virtual events, all the community meetups that are happening. You've got to be plugged into that to understand the tone, the sentiment, but also who are those people that are running these events? I mean, Salesforce is sort of gold standard in the space, especially in enterprise and the the trailblazer community. I know uh, Erica Cole is a good friend of mine. She was a driving force who built that whole experience. Uh, She's now a very successful consultant. And so, you know, it's the point where your super fans are so passionate about the brand and the experience. They want to get together and barbecue and talk about, talk about the product. And it's the same thing, you know, Apple, same thing. You go, there's a new iPhone 15 or 16 coming out. People are camping out at the Apple stores. And, you know, Robert Swill was a very famous Apple guru. He, I think he was on many newspaper covers back in the day. And he was always the first person camped out at the, uh, the Apple store in Cupertino. So you reach that level of passion. And so when in SAP's world, we have a massive community. It's been around online for more than 20 years. We still get more than 3 million unique visitors every month. And right now, I was excited to join really as a strategist to help improve or I should say, help the vision of the next five years where, where we want to go. And so right now, we're, we're doing a lot of work to improve the overall online experience. But also, we're thinking about how do we connect the dots across the company so that our organizations are working better together and taking advantage of this, this big community in addition to... How do we get plugged into the conversations that are happening in the channels we don't own, as well as the organizations that are running the user groups? So there's a lot of work to be done. You know, we're making progress, but this is really about a lot of heavy lifting on the back end as as far as our own experience that we do on. Yeah. Thank you for that description. I would like to dive into this even a little bit more because maybe I'm actually slow just to describe for you and listeners I would think tennis fit me well because I'm very individualistic. (laughs) When there was something going wrong, I'm the one person I lean on. And so literally, even at work, one of the things I had to learn is how do I unleash even the power of the team and bring people together? I'm definitely better than I used to be. And I'm sure there's much more I can still learn and improve. But one thing that even stood out to me is how you talk about the community and importance. And it really seems that you just get it and it comes so natural to you, Donnie. So what are some of the things or maybe you would guide a person like me to look at? Why is community so important? And how should one start to build it? Sure. So there's many ways to look at it. And and I think you need to ask yourself, well, what's the context? Am I, you know, a... Mm -hmm founder of a startup, you know, I'm getting seed money. Everybody has a community. And so when you when you come into an experience, you say, you know, well, how are you going to start it? So even like, for example, I went to Domo, it's like, well, you're already having conversations with your customers, right? You know who your most important customers are. You know who your most passionate users are. So you start with them. I mean, mm-hmm. again, they're your most important customers. So it's sort of when you're building that vision, you want to incubate and kind of crowdsource again those most important beta customers to help you, you know, drive the vision. So there are communities that are essentially you could build a whole product around a community. If we think about more like an enterprise world and you start to talk to, well, where's the ROI? Why should we be we be investing, you know, this much money in a platform and a whole team? And well, most people don't want to ask for help. Most people don't want to pick up the phone and call support and talk to somebody in another country. They want to just Google it and find the answer. And so if you create that experience, guess what? And they find the answer and it actually helps them. Then you're actually preventing them or you're creating a situation where there's no support deflection. They're not going to pick up the phone and cost the company X dollars for every hour they're going to talk to one of your agents. So there's a support savings. That's number one. Number two, as you ask questions in community or even elsewhere that's brought into the community, if it's on YouTube or Twitter and someone successfully answers it and that helps that person, that becomes rich content. And now becomes a knowledge-based article. Because if you have that question, then there's at least 10 other customers that have the same question or they will. And so if you can then put that in a place where it's easy for someone else to find it, then it becomes valuable content and it becomes part of a, a learning journey. 
in the B2B world, which SAP lives in, why do people spend time in community? Well, SAP professionals are getting measured on how successful they are in implementing our software. And it's not easy software to manage. It's very complex. And this is not unique to us. It's probably true of Salesforce and Oracle and all the other big players. So the person who's in charge or is responsible for using our software at, at let's say, Deutsche Bank or Fidelity or, or Universal Studio, whatever it may be, they want to basically get better at using our product. How do they do that? How do they learn and grow? Well, they can learn in the community. They can connect with others. So if I'm a manager of finance at Deutsche Bank, I want to find, I want to meet the person has the same job, the same role at another company. Because then I could say, all right, I don't want to talk to this SAP salesperson. I want to talk to you and say, well, all right, how was the last release of this product? How many people do you have on your team? How are you getting the most value out of the investment? What tips and tricks is, again, we've got all the release notes, you've got training videos, you've got webinars, we've got certifications. That's all everybody for the most part can get to that stuff. But then there's beyond that. There's the human element of our customers and most customers will always find a another use case. They'll figure something out that the team didn't really think about or hadn't discovered yet. So you want to have a capture that knowledge. And so, so how does that add value? The more that you can enable your customers to be more knowledgeable about your product and get better at using your product, guess what? It's like anything else. The more someone uses a product, mm -hmm. by default, they like it more and they have more demand for it. They've prepared a thirst for that product. And so that leads to greater demand, greater upsells, greater retention. It minimizes attrition. That becomes potentially big money. And so th this is a language that then re resonates with marketing and sales and customer success. You know, the content piece is very useful for the education teams because, again, they can take those tidbits of content, whether it be Q&A or videos or discussions and convert those into learning journeys. And again, mm -hmm. anything else, you can't create 10 years of learning in, in a one hour webinar. People are busy. So you've got to find these, you know, 30 minute, 60 minute, or even short, quick one videos. And so all of that can be done within the community. And then lastly, like anything else, your most passionate customers are going to tell you how to get better. So if you can tap into your community to actually get great ideas and, and crowdsource that and have them be, give them the ability to suggest and vote up and comment, then they feel like they're part of the team. They feel like they're getting their voice heard. And they're now their representation in the community becomes even stronger. And so showing that the brand is listening and actually adopting. Now, it's not going to mean that you're going to do every idea or it's going to happen tomorrow. You've got to set expectations. Well, yeah. We hear you as on under consideration. It's going to take time, but and most people understand. Of course, you're going to have some naysayers like, "Well, this has been around. I wanted that five years ago." And sometimes you say, "Well, I'm sorry, it's just not a priority. This is why." But that's better than not saying anything. The point is that community is about having that transparency, having that open conversation, and again, connecting people. And one analogy that we use a lot is actually it's like creating a cafe with your brand on it. Mm. So anybody that has, you know, wants to have a conversation about your brand can come by the main entrance and then it's sort of like, okay, well, who are you? And what do you want to talk about? And say, oh, you're a VIP, come to the back room. Or you want to talk to sales or over here, or you want to talk about, and you get, you navigate to the right place. So it's the same kind of thing. And of course you may get a, a disgruntled customer and you just say, I'm sorry. And, and you move on. But for the most part, most people get it. And so that leads to kind of that, the business values around, you know, again, deflection and content, the value of content creation, the customer retention piece is huge. And again, these things take time to curate. But if you do that successfully, then you're getting stickiness on your brands. And with that, you're then getting passionate members from that account that are actually influencing the people writing the checks. So that becomes, you know, incredibly valuable. And of course, the ideas piece is saving you tons on market research, number one. It's also creating brand value because you're showing your customers that they're listening to you. And thirdly, it can help you validate, all right, well, let's look under the hood. Who's actually talking about the ideas? Is it the CEO's best friend he went to college with who's running a small startup? Or is it, you know, these are top five accounts that are actually spending 10% of, you know, they're, they're accounting for 10% of our revenue. So now the VP of engineering actually has context. Where did the mm -hmm. idea come from? And what does it mean? Okay, if we do this, how much more business will we get? So then you've got actually data that it's an informed decision. Thank you for describing it. And it made me think about all the things I'm not doing or doing wrong in creating this Grand Slam journey community. Because one of the things, there's many reasons for my podcast, but it's obviously for myself to learn from guests and bring up 
the best in my guess around the, what I call the athletic mindset. I think it's not specific to athletes. I think athletes must have it in order to be great, but other people possess this athletic mindset too of always wanting to be better at what they do and improve and grow and be the best at their role, whatever they're doing. But I definitely didn't create enough opportunity to connect with my listeners. So maybe that's one thing I'm going to start adding. And I always thought it was so weird that people schedule these calls. And now I know why <laughs> <laughs> they actually work. So I'm going to try creating one. Donnie, thank you so much for that. Yeah, well, now you've got, you know, you've got your Grand Slam alumni uh, group. So yes, I've actually thought about that too, of creating just a group of my Grand Slam journey guests too so they can reach out and connect with one okay. another look at that community that you know elon has built now with leap it's it's pretty amazing yes it started pretty small so it can happen yeah and that's definitely i think one of the biggest benefits of that program right the community that you get through it and the mm -hmm. people like you actually were here on the podcast because of that so yeah yeah in fact yeah, last week, actually, I was reached out to by a good friend of mine from my HP days. He's part of the American Marketing Association in Sacramento, and they had an event, I think it was on Thursday night. It was a fundraiser for the SPCA, and it was like a local beer garden. And actually, a different Clara from Leap, she's local. I invited her. She showed up, so I got to meet her. And then I realized another friend of mine from my HP days, I went to grad school with her years ago, uh, Kirsten Gage, she just joined Leap like three months ago. Great. So we both met up at the event. That was pretty cool. Nice. I wonder if it would be useful also to dive a little more into what you call the MSEE model for community, because I was browsing through your LinkedIn, and it's definitely something that caught my eye. You stated mm -hmm. that something that provides value to each of the verticals do you want to touch base on it, Donnie? Or what else would you want to mention about the community aspect? I did touch upon it a little bit. I didn't call it out in that way, but it's a model I, I developed sort of in my first sabbatical and when I was in kind of investing on my expertise and kind of sharing this knowledge. And I actually used that in a slide deck when I got hired at Kaltura. But it's really that those four pillars of value that community can bring to business. And so when done right and getting that level of advocacy within an account, that's actually driving up sales and retention, but it's also driving referrals and customer stories. So that benefits marketing. The support piece is usually something that can be captured pretty early on in your journey, because again, you can measure online, survey customers, ask them, did you find what you're looking for? Do you intend to contact uh, support? So those are measurable dollars. The education piece is really on that rich content. So if it's a valuable conversation on use cases and or, you know, successfully answer questions, you know, again, those things help the customer learning journeys. And the last one's around the innovation because now your engineering team's got a huge pool of really smart people and more importantly, passionate customers that not only want to tell them how to make the product better, but they can also, based on their persona, their profile, their ranking, whatever it may be, one of the benefits of community is the recognition. You know, you can they could be invited to a beta program and actually kick the tires on some different ideas and be part of a focus group. So all of those things are <clears throat> highly valuable to uh, to the brand. And again, in most communities, you've got sort of sort of this, some say it's a 99-1 model, sometimes it's like 70-20-10, somewhere in that mix. The vast majority of people in online world are just going to Google, they're going to read it, they're going to consume the content, and they're going to move on. They're never going to sign in because they're just going to browse. And that's fine. That larger percentage or the, the mid-level one are sort of these passive contributors, meaning they, they chime in once in a month, a few times a quarter. They'll like a bunch of stuff, they'll tag some stuff, they'll ask a question, they'll comment, and they're a very important piece of the puzzle too. There's a really small percentage that's anywhere between 1% and 5% that are your most passionate and active members in the community. And the reason that they're so motivated is they want to get recognition as being an expert on your brand. And so they care about the gamification. They want to be on the leaderboard. They want to get the monthly recognitions by the community. They want to get invitations to your conferences. They want to be held. They want to be um, invited as a speaker somewhere. They want to get discounts to your learning offerings. And the reason they're doing that is they want to show their manager that they have an outside reference point that says, hey, I'm an SAP expert. I'm now. And when I built the Domo community, I what Domo means is actually thanks in Japanese. Like you could say, Domo arigato is thank you very much. And 
the ranking structure I came up with was like in martial arts. You have a you know a belt structure. And so we start out with a as visitor, then a a white belt, and move all the way to a black belt. So when we ultimately had, it took several years, Domo black belts and people who were, earned those community awards. I mean, they were put, putting that on LinkedIn. They were showing their management because they want to get promoted or they want to get hired across the street. So there's a lot of motivation there. And so those people have become the most valuable members of your community because, again, they're there all the time. They're providing a lot of valuable content. They've become an extension of the team. And, and also... When I talked about this earlier, this community everywhere theme that's really going on in the marketplace now, it's not just in the domain that you own, because not everyone's going to show up there. Where are those top members that are providing a lot of engagement in LinkedIn, in Twitter, mm-hmm. YouTube, GitHub, Stack Over, wherever it may be, that's relevant to your brand? And also, you have other members that are like, you know what, the digital space is not for me. I want to go to all the user groups. I want to host events. I want to meet people in person. So understanding, okay, who are my top people in Chicago or New York or in San Francisco and having a a program that recognizes them in a similar manner, because again, they're part of your extended community. If you're able to do it right, then you've got this passionate army that you can't spend enough marketing dollars to to get to the level of brand love and recognition that they're going to provide in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanted to double click on that really you mentioned, but I want to highlight one more time is the stories you can get from them to help innovate to the next level, right? Because they're such an authentic user, as well as mm-hmm. you can use them to showcase somebody how they're using the technology or the software, how it help them transform. And I've been in sales business development for quite a while, but really there's nothing better than showcasing those examples, it's the most powerful way if you have this community and lead from those examples. Because I would say most people don't really trust us salespeople because they think we're salesy. I'm sure there's truth to that. (laughs) So if you can just talk to somebody or really learn from why they chose the technology they did and how it would help them evolve and solve the problems they have faced, I think that's just the most authentic and real way to communicate that as somebody can learn from. I mean, I'll give you a great example. Um, I presented about 30 to 40 user groups for Domo in North America years back. And this is later in my time there. I think it was, it was summer of 2019. And we're in the loop in Chicago. And early in the year, we had our community awards and our, our customer conference. We had our first time issuing black belts. And one of the things I came up with you know, every year early on, we had like a lunch, then it was a happy hour, it became a hundred person event at our at our conference. I would have these really cool framed awards. We'd have some really cool swag, like you know, demo branded AirPods or like a little trophy. But then budgets were getting tight. And um, we now had five black belts. So I went to my my youngest martial arts studio. I said, Where do you guys get your black belts? And they connected to the vendor, and I had five real black belts made. It had Domo on one end, the brand. It had the dojo, which was the community, and had their community handle in the middle. And nobody except for me knew about it. So we get to the award ceremony to have under a blanket. And we had a big, you know, step and repeat wall with our brand. And when I handed these out, people went crazy. They were like, where do I get one of those? And again, it was like a $20 item. But the point was, it was a, it was a real black belt. And with that, so I'm in Chicago and... We're partnering up with education. We now had what we were calling major Domo awards for people who really were, uh, I think it was our first 10 people that had the, the Domo admin certification program. So I was flying to Chicago. We had, it, was, it was a glass award. So I actually carried it in my suitcase. And one of my black belts, Scott Thompson from Abbott Labs, was there. So I'm presenting to him the awards. And what I didn't know is that there was someone from, a, I think, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. She was a new customer. She's sitting in the audience. And I'm presenting to Scott, and she's telling her colleague, oh, the thing was, Scott had one of the coolest avatars. He actually had an avatar which was half Clark Kent and half Superman in our community. And he took his digital award for the um, for the certification. He took the digital image, and he put his avatar on top of it, and he posted that in the community. So long and short, his, his, he was known as Superman in the community, and... She's talking to her colleague. Oh my God, there's Superman in the flesh. He's answered like, you know, a whole bunch of my questions. And so we're at the, you know, we're at the happy hour afterwards in the evening at, at a bar. And she's like, oh, I, I want a selfie with Superman. 
<laughs> That's awesome. And uh, I mean, who would want to have questions answered by Superman? That sounds pretty cool. It's a smart marketing too to pick the right picture or representation. Yeah. And she came up with a creative name. She actually coined this term. It's a Doma Liberty. Yes. Thing where yeah. you're getting that kind of story and then, you know, showcasing it and showing and you know, talking about how now this new customer is now learning from, you know, our experienced person and they've connected and mm -hmm. it's great. Yeah. Anyone who's still contemplating about the importance of community, power of community, and they don't know how or where to start, any tips, Donna, you would give them of how to get there or what to think about? as now hopefully this conversation inspired them to think about the importance of community. Oh, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of really good resources. So two of my closest friends in the industry who are the top in this world, they're not both successful consultants, uh, Brian Oblinger, as well as Erica Cool. they started doing a podcast during COVID. And it's called uh, In Before the Lock. I'll get you the URL to share out. Awesome. Anyway, so the end before the lock basically means, so in, in the forum world, uh, from a moderator perspective, you've got the ability to kind of lock bad behavior out of the community. And so they kind of jokingly called their podcast in before the lock. And so what they did is they've got over 100 podcasts, uh, looking at it now 103, and they really have just emptied their brain on anything and everything about community, all kinds of resources. I think I've been referenced in there several times. That's a great place to start. You, you can learn a ton. There are a couple other places. You know, CMX Hub's got some some great resources. The Community Club. Brian Oblig actually just started a brand new thing called the Community Academy. It launched pretty recently, and I haven't had a chance to go into the really deep dive in there. But knowing Brian, it's just going to have a wealth of uh, courses, information. There's a lot of free stuff out there, so that'd be another good place uh, to have a look. And then. Um, People can also reach out to me directly if they want to uh, connect and learn more about ABCs around community. Excellent. I'll add those resources to the episode notes and, of course, your LinkedIn profile as well. But I do want to a little bit also transition, I guess, community, hopefully with everything that's been happening as well. There's a big community being built around the support of everything that people are facing there with the attack of the Hamas. It's been horrifying reading the articles and seeing the videos. I know you mentioned you have family and friends there. Anything you want to state in regards to that or support? I know you're following local news. Maybe how can people help? Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, there's really people live in a tough neighborhood and they're dealing with people that frankly have no value on life and have no interest in coexisting, at least the leadership. And they demonstrated that with the, the barbarism that took place in recent days. It's a very difficult situation. And, you know, being well connected, especially with the, the Israeli tech community, you know, we're, we're, we're sharing a lot of resources. I'm trying to pull up a couple of links that I could put out and provide to you as well if people want to help out. But I think that at the end of the day, Part of the challenge as well as had is having a part, finding a partner for peace. And that's been a challenge because when they the other side says they want a two two state solution, well, the reality is they don't want any state solution. They want to stay for themselves and nothing for love for Israel. So it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. Again, we're like we're dealing with a level of barbarism, I don't think, that we've witnessed in our lifetime. It's kind of reenacting of what happened in Nazi Germany, but possibly worse. And Thankfully, the, the Israeli army is strong and they're going to uh, take care of business, but it's going to take time and it's going to be very painful. But uh, at the end, Goldman had a great quote saying, you know, peace will come when the Arabs love their children more than, than themselves. And so it's a sad reality, but that's just that's, that's what we're dealing with. Yeah. I really have no words because I, I feel like this situation of. I don't know how to say it even in the right ways. The reality is people killing others for just being different than they are or having different beliefs. Like, it's just something that I know has existed ever since the history of our times, but I still can't wrap my head around it. And I know this conflict, and especially the Middle East, has been full of conflicts forever. And so I'm educated a little bit around it, kind of what I read. But the reality is, because I haven't lived there, I don't think I can fully sense and feel and understand. I think one thing is to really grab there and going through it. And another thing is 
to just read the news or kind of observe what's happening. What's your take on it, Donnie? Anything you want to share in regards to even just the history or how you see this potentially playing out? One of the things that I've been reading, people are comparing it to pretty much the 9-11 in the US, but on an even larger scheme. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> Again, to put this into perspective, I'm at a population of, you know, eight, nine million Israelis and for a thousand of their citizens to be murdered in cold blood, women, children, elderly and soldiers. It's 10x what 9-11 was and or Pearl Harbor. But it's just more than what took place. It's also how it happened and what they did and the barbarism and the fact that they are the brutality I mean, some of it's just indescribable, but, you know, small examples for them to go invade communities and go door to door and kill a daughter in front of the rest of the family or to murder a grandmother and then take her phone and film the, on a Facebook live on their family chat, her killing. I mean, these are just levels of barbarism that are just not comprehensible. And even this festival, this raid festival, you know, they had 3,520 year olds there and it, it was the theme is about peace. And, and that was one of the motivations for going in. They knew that this was happening. It was two miles from the border and they slaughtered hundreds of these kids. They even took some hostage. So again, the history is long. I mean, the net net is that back in 48, the state was established. There was a UN resolution. Uh, the Israelis accepted the resolution. The Arab countries did not. They were invaded by seven armies. Israel survived it. My father actually fought in that war. Mm -hmm. The country lost 1% of its population. And since then, there's been, frankly, no, no partner for peace. Aside from Egypt and Jordan, who went through bloody wars, and now they said, okay, we have one of peace. But the net is with the Palestinians, which have now turned Gaza into a terrorist state and are being funded by Iran. And again, we got to take a step back and look at this. Is, there's a global picture playing out here. And Iran is funding Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and they're not our friends. So there's a, there's a much bigger geopolitical situation here. You know, Israel will survive and get through this. It's just going to be very, very painful. A few books I could recommend. There's one by an author, Noah Tishby, called Israel's Simple Guide. Uh, another one, Daniel Gordis, G-O-R-D-I-S, Israel, a Concise History of a, of a Nation Reborn. There's another one called Startup Nation. But at the end of the day, this is about a, a different type of civilization. And so it's a question of, is it a civilization that values life? Because again, Israel is a, is, a, is a democratic elected country that actually has Arab, Christian, and Jewish populations. You know, people don't realize that there are Arab ministers in the government, there are Arab Supreme Court members, there are Arab doctors, and the vast majority of the population gets along. Sadly, we have a terrorist organization that wants to destroy all of that. Right now, you know, it's praying for the safety of everybody there and that this can end as quickly as possible. But I also know this is going to be a long road. And I'm just trying to pull up. I can send you offline. There's there's a, in a variety of organizations that are that are trustworthy. People want to send you know, tax donations to, to help with the situation. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll ensure to add that to the episode notes, too. And hopefully we'll find a way to in this craziness uh, sooner rather than later. And uh, I have full trust in the Israeli military. I've heard it's one of the best in the world, obviously, even from kind of just understanding the attacks. And so I think this was one of the things also that caught, I'm sure, everybody in Israel and the world by surprise, just because it happened so abruptly without really anybody knowing that and knowing about the attack and just obviously the scale of it. So Hopefully, we will get the crazy people under control and contained and make them pay whatever, you know, the justice system asks for, for what they have done. I think it's just the only thing we can hope for and people will support Israel in, in whatever way. I know we at our organization do have a way to do that. And so whether it's through our personal contributions or the corporations that are opening paths to support through our charity programs. Maybe on that note, to end, one of the articles I've been reading today is a little bit related to that and just the craziness that's been happening in this world lately through the wars, obviously started with the war in Ukraine and the 
conflicts in the Middle East continue to escalate. If nothing else, this is obviously an example of it. And the article also talked about potentially the risk of weakening U.S. as being the world power to really help alleviate some of these conflicts and step and support them. And you know, we all can question whether that is right or wrong. But what I'm thinking about, there's a lot of these things happening in the world. What would you inspire people to be doing more of or less of, Danny? Wow. Ah. Well, I think a few things. One is to, you know, I think we need at the end of the day, we need to kind of love, love the neighbor and think about how we want to be treated as, you know, fellow human beings, but also be involved with your local and federal governments and letting them know if you're agree with what they're doing or not, not agree with, be part of the process. And if you're not sure about what's going on, you know, educate yourselves, question authority. There's a lot of great resources out there. And also, you're not going to get a history lesson by, you know, following a Twitter feed or, or watching a TikTok video. That's not going to work. So there's a lot of great content, I think, more relevant on maybe on YouTube. But, you know, do your research. Talk to people who've lived there. Connect with people that are part of that community or, you know, whether they're from Ukraine or from Russia or from Israel, whatever it may be. I mean, even now, like just watching, you know, it, it infuriates me. Is just there is so much uh, anti-Israel hatred in the world. And... I think there's a lot of a lot of many people, for example, there were demonstrations in, in Times Square, San Francisco, Seattle yesterday, you know, supporting the Palestinian cause. But they're doing so in a manner where there's no condemnation of the barbaric acts that the Palestinian terrorists did. They all are chanting they're like they're freedom fighters and heroes. So is it really heroic and freedom fighters to murder women, children, and elderly in their homes? To take babies hostage to rape dozens of girls at a concert while they're next to their dead friends and then kidnap some of them it's just mind and so the fact like if you're really standing there and not condemning those activities and saying oh yeah because this is the in thing then you have no credibility so i think that people get caught up in like the craze online or going to this event and they don't understand uh the context and so that's the reality that Israel is dealing with. And I know that there's a long road ahead, but, you know, Israel is going to persevere and uh, carry on. I concur with that. And yeah, and just hopefully this will end sooner than later with obviously the people who are doing this crazy barbaric thing, paying for what I have done. And we will be able to hopefully live in some sort of peace and Anything else you would want to mention for the end? I will, again, add your LinkedIn profile and some of the resources to the episode notes. But anyone who wants to talk about tennis or building a community, uh, what is the best way to reach you or find more information? Yeah, so LinkedIn is good. And my LinkedIn profile is just slash IN slash uh, Donnie Weinstein. And Twitter, my handle is uh, DannyBoy777. I'll give that to, uh, to Clara to put in the, in the notes and yeah feel free to reach out excellent someday either when you're out in california or i get to texas see if we can you guys can have coffee and we go uh, hit some tennis balls 100 percent. if you have a trip to austin please let me know if you enjoyed okay. this episode i want to ask you to please do two things that would help me greatly one please consider leaving a review on apple Podcasts, spotify or any other podcasting platform that you use to listen to this episode two Please share this podcast with a friend who you believe might enjoy it as well. It is a great way to remind someone you care about them by sharing a conversation they might be interested in. Thank you for listening. 